Well, once again, hello everyone. This is Terry from Jensen. I'm happy to have you with me. And um, this will be our last Facebook Live before the Christmas holiday. So I thought I'd give you a little uh, fair warning there, or some cause to celebrate or whatever. So good morning or good day or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. We're glad to have you with us. And uh, today we're going to be talking about all things structure for the Mio because it's it's not usually covered and and structure is one of those things that if you don't use it and you and you have to use it all of a sudden eh, you're better off to have practiced with it a little bit so let's go ahead and get started because this is a little bit longer facebook live than we're used to okay so when you get your kits the Mio structure made easy. You're going to come with the window and the enamel in the new kits, and the new kits we've had for like the last year. So we'll talk about these mainly today because we're mainly talking about technique and application and things like that. Now, a simple tip here is if you're curious when to use the window or enamel, the enamel is mainly for the higher value, lower chroma shades, A1, A2, B1, B2, things like that. And the structure window is more of a water clear, and those are usually for the older shades that are higher chroma, lower value. So we're going to start off with mixing. And honestly, if you don't know how to mix this stuff, don't do it wrong. You want to use a non-metallic spatula mix because this has a higher ceramic content so it can abrade the spatula. And use a patting motion, shear thinning to pat the material. You don't want to stir it up. We don't want to create air bubbles. The material should appear homogeneous with a wet, shiny surface. And it, it should be kind of like silicone that has water on it. And you see this is kind of lumpy here. It's kind of hard. And although the shear thinning, think of shear thinning as like squeezing a damp sponge. So the steering like a liquid would incorporate air bubbles. And, and these look like pearls because of the refractive index of air. And the structure should be able to cut and then shear thinned. And when I'm patting this together to bring moisture up and make it homogenous, I want to make sure that I have the moisture content throughout it. But this mix exhibits a dryness that will make it a little bit uh, rougher to work with. And only use the in-sync paste glaze liquid. All right, so we're going to put a little bit on here. I can see it on my colored spatula. And normally what I would do is I would put this in the jar and put the uh, lid on for about five or ten minutes and let it soak in there. But you can pat it in place. You know, whatever works for you. It, it really depends upon your time constraints. But you always, when you're reconstituting it, you always want to use the in-sync paste glaze liquid. So I'm going to cut a little bit off right here. And you see it, it kind of chunks. This white dryness is a good indicator of the material that is slightly too dry to work well. So I put it on my glass slab, and I have a piece of light blue paper taped underneath this glass slab. And when I go to mash it, uh, even though it looked like it was homogenous and damp in the jar, you, you see it's a little chunky right here, kind of like uh, dry cookie dough. So this is slightly too dry and cakey. This isn't going to work well at all. So, I mean, you can, you, if it's a little too dry, you can still mix it on the slab. Again, with a non-metallic spatula because you don't want to get the metallic particles in there. And I'm going to mash it and smear it. So I can be sure when I'm smearing it that I won't have air bubbles in it. And you notice how better it, it manipulates with just a little bit of liquid in it. And it doesn't take much. We're not trying to make this into a, a, a viscous paste. More than anything else, we're trying to make it kind of like a Play-Doh, kind of like a light cure composite type consistency. And I like to smear it on my glass slab and get it about a half a millimeter, six tenths thick uh, in that range because it, it, you're able to see dirt specks or air bubbles and gauge the, the, the thickness by its translucency. So I have the blue here. So you should see a little bit of the blue shine through. If you have it on a black surface, you'll see black. But you'll be able to see through it. So I'm going to make this a little bit too wet so you can see what you can do. Now this is from the same jar. So... I got some liquid there. I'm, I'm making it way, way more uh, thin than I would normally do it. Now, of course, I 
sped that up a little bit. But you can see now it's kind of a, a pasty mayonnaise type consistency. And when it's this thicker and, and thin and creamy, then it, it's going to want to stick to the spatula. It's going to be like a liquid adhesive. It, it's, it's not that much fun. So notice the sticky residue on the spatula. When you see it like this, this is just as hard to work with as it is when it's too dry. But the nice part is, is because it is a ceramic, we can blot it. Now, remember, the base for this is pretty much the InSync Paste Glaze liquid or something very similar to it. So that's more viscous, so it's going to blot a lot slower. Where we can blot porcelain and in two or three seconds we're done. I would tell you that when you're blotting this, uh, you're going to need about 10 seconds, eight eight to 12 seconds in that range somewhere. It'll look like cotton flannel. So you see that consistency right there. Now it looks soft, but it's, it's when you've taken out the liquid, now it's the consistency you want it to be. And now I can smear it thin. And you're going to find it's going to work a lot easier if you have it kind of like that clay, Play-Doh, light cure composite type consistency. So there it is straight from the jar where I added some material to the jar. And there it is after I blot it. Same consistency, basically. And you, you can see where it's, you start to able to see through it uh, just a little bit. And, and that lets you know that you're at a certain thickness or thinness. So about three to five tenths of a millimeter, you should be able to see through the mix a little bit. And that's all I want. And you want to expect, inspect for air bubbles and dirt specks and lint because the, the dirt and the lint, it does not burn out. And I, and I have something I'll show you later here that will show you that. And the larger pieces are, are difficult to pick up. But if you get small pieces, they're very easy to pick up. So those small pieces that I'm cutting off, they're about the size of, say, a four or six round burr head. So about a millimeter, millimeter. 0.2 millimeter 0.3 if you try to pick up a large piece now maybe some people can do this and i know james Choi can do it but i can't when you pick up a big piece with a brush it's like picking up a wet blanket with a broomstick it's very very hard to maneuver it so these little pieces are easy to pick up and then what i do is is i cut these like into little rectangles or tiles and i can place them on the restoration so I cut all the way down the glass, kind of like if you were cutting brownies. Whatever I don't use, if I'm not going to use it, I know I'm not going to use it. I put it back in the jar so there's less chance of it drying out or getting lint or dirt in it because dirt is your nemesis in this. And there's no need to waste this stuff. I mean, anything I don't use, as long as I know it's clean, I stick it back in the jar. And when, when I wipe it like this where it's about a half a millimeter thick, I can see the dirt. So if I do have dirt in it, I can pick it out if I need to. Now, these flattened type brushes are very handy for smoothing and blending. These are like the paste opaque brushes we used to get in days past. And the Mio number no. three brush is great because it's got synthetic in the middle and sable on the outside. So it's a little stiffer and it's very easy to use. So you see my little tiles I've cut. And I can use distilled water. Water can be used to manipulate and shape the structure. And it handles slightly easier than just using the InSync Paste Glaze liquid for everything. Now, the main reason we use InSync Paste Glaze with colors is because it gives you the WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. But with the structure, if it's slightly opacious, we can actually see the texture better. And it bakes out clean. So here I have a zirconia blade. And what I did is I made it similar to like Belle de St. Clair's uh, little porcelain spatula, which you'll see here right there. So I made something like that out of zirconia and I attached it to a, you know, paintbrush handle like technicians do. And I can push down to the glass in the cut marks there. And I'm going to swipe from left to right because, well, because I'm left-handed. You probably do it the opposite way if you're right-handed. But you push down the glass and you swipe smartly and you see it picks up just like a little uh, flag right there. And I can place this and let it sit like a decal or like a sticker on the restoration. And then I continue doing this till I have 
pretty much all of it covered. Now, normally I do, I cut them in angles and stuff so I can fit in different areas. But I'm going to show you, even with a bad application, what you do. Because when you start off, yeah, your applications might not be exactly what you want and what they'll be after several times of doing this. So when I take my flat brush, and I generally get it a little bit of distilled water in it, and I wipe it back two or three times across my thumb to get it so it has about a maybe a 30% water content in it. And I'll use the flat side of the brush to mash these little pieces flat against the restoration so that they're adhered with no air bubbles. And I can also use it to mash and blend any of those juncture lines between the pieces. Again, a little bit of water helps us move around. Now, it'll get too wet and you can always blot it. So you see the brush right there. I'm using one of those little pieces that I cut off. Those little chunks that were the size of, say, a four or six round burr head. And now I'm using the side of the brush to mash it down and smooth it. I don't really, when it's wet, stroke it too awfully much with a regular brush because it'll tend to make little stripes in it. With a flat brush, using a very parallel motion, I can do a little bit. But then you can see there's an area in the cervical there where you can see through it more. So I add just a little bit more in there until it looks homogenous in color with the rest of the facial of that restoration. And that'll give me a good indication that my thickness is pretty much consistent. Now, when you look at this, it looks like it's thicker than it actually is. And that's because the opacity of it. And I'll show you this towards the end of this presentation, too, so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Because in the beginning, if you're new to structure, it's very common for us to apply structure way too thick. And I'm going to tell you that, that thick structure actually is not to your benefit. Structure that's in the two to three tenths of a millimeter range is about all you really need, and making it thicker serves no purpose. So if it gets too loose or too runny or too sticky, just blot it. Again, it's going to take a little bit longer than porcelain, maybe four to six seconds at a very minimum. And when you lift your tissue, it'll give you kind of a, a flannel, cotton flannel look. And you can pinch off the excess. In other words, like chopping it off with your instrument. It's much faster than a brush. And it creates a much cleaner job. Just cut it off kind of like uh, scissors. You're just slicing it off, kind of like a cookie cutter would cut cookie dough. Okay, filling and smoothing in and going slightly over the incised ledge tends to eliminate lifting. I found if I have the edge of the structure right even with the edge of the facial incisal edge, sometimes it'll peel. So I go ever so slightly over and then I feather it in. And you always want to finish off your finish lines, whether it's proximally or cervically or incisally. And again, just like porcelain, because this is a high ceramic, you can tap it or vibrate it and bring some moisture up on the surface, should you need to. And we can see it right there. It's nice and smooth. It's a little bit on the wet side. And unless you're trying to put a specific anatomy in there, if it's too wet, it just gets a little bit um, sticky. So primary shaping I use is quicker, and, and with if I use an instrument, uh, they show it using a brush, and you can use a brush, but to create the primary impressions as far as uh, developmental lobes or, or pericomata or imbrication lines, I find if I start them with an instrument and then I finesse them, all that is is an endophile, and I've polished well, like the last two or three millimeters of the spirals off the tip. If anybody's looking for that, it's a great instrument. It's a little handle with a scoop on one end and the endophile on the other. It's made by Vacalon and it's about 23 or 24 bucks. Okay, so now I'm using that number three Mio brush that has the synthetic on the inside but sable on the outside. So it's a little stiff, but then again, it is very gentle. And I can finesse whatever I started with my instrument. This is the number five Mio brush. It's great for pericomata. It's also great for picking up dirt and lint. And I used to wipe it with my fingers, you know, like, like uh, between your thumb and your forefinger. 
excuse me, um, to try to clean it. But I found that using a microfiber towel is much more efficient. So if I want to put in paracamata, if, if it's too stiff, it's, it's not going to go in there. So I bring up a little bit of moisture on the surface, not much. Remember, this isn't porcelain. This is very thick. And with a little bit of pressure and about a 30, 45 degree angle, I kind of like wiggle it, not in a straight line across, kind of serpentine. You see the chafe on the mesial aspect of that central, showing that the brush did pick up material. If it's too wet, you can't really see it too well. So the resulting paracamata, your oven must be dialed in because if you overfire this more than three or four degrees Celsius, you'll start to melt out the paracamata you put in there. Okay, if I want a sharp mesial and sizal edge right there, I can add it because, uh, you know, it's going to give, if your furnace is dialed in to give you a, a good bake, uh, you know, if you stick it in one way, it's not going to come out differently. So you got to stick it in there exactly like you want it. With the paracamata, if you want a sharp mesial and sizal edge, if you have a, a surface texture, if you have finish lines, all those things need to be exactly where you want them. This material is very dense. It bakes exactly the way you have it, assuming you've dialed in your furnace. And I would suggest those labs out there that have five or six furnaces. We all know that all la all furnaces have their own personality. Get it dialed in for each specific furnace. Now you can see the pair come out of now and that. You can see some developmental lobes. And sometimes, uh, like I said, the slight blotting will make the surface detail a little bit more apparent. But you can see it right there. A lot of texture in that restoration. So every time you work on the facial or the cervical or anywhere, you're kind of vibrating a little bit. So don't forget that it, it, it's going to bring up moisture and it's going to and it's going to like mash the material a little bit. So anytime you do any manipulation, check your finish lines before you're ready to fire it to make sure they're feathered in. It it's not a total necessity, but boy, it sure and uh, it ensures that you're going to have a, a a bake that is. Uh, has a happy ending that, that, you know, it comes out and you're thrilled with what you get. We don't like surprises that are bad surprises. Now to check the thickness of the application. Remember, you don't want this stuff real thick. This is not a repair porcelain. So I take my endophile where I've polished off the last two or three millimeters of spirals and I check it until I hit the surface and you can see I am right there. Now, you, if you look at that, you see the little divot where I checked it. <laughs> Remember to close these holes, please. Take a brush and just lightly push them closed. You don't need any water. Just kind of mash them because the material is like a clay. Then I just go over anything. I want to make sure that it's exactly the way I want it because the more it goes in perfect, the more it comes out perfect. So on the peg with peg putty, one last final inspection, make sure my finish lines are done, my cervical, my proximal, my incisal. You see I have a slight incisal overlap, probably uh, one and a half to two tenths. Okay. So final review, have your oven cycle tested for the structure. Make sure you have it dialed in before that case is due the next day so you don't freak out. Ensure the entire label is covered with structure. If you have any framework that's exposed, it'll look bright. Smooth all your finish lines before you fire it and check for depth of application. And after you check it with the end of file, fix those holes and double check, triple check, quadruple check for dirt, lint, bubbles, and voids. Get any dirt out. Don't get it out with a brush. Use your endo file or something like that. So some afterthoughts. Well, you see down there the cervical third on the distal where you can see it, I have a thin spot. So I can blend it in. I can mash the material over. It doesn't have to be very thick. It just can't have exposed Emacs or Lisi or Zirconia because it'll be a bright shine and it'll show through. So you can block this and make sure you have enough. When it's wet, it gets more translucent. So I'll generally blot it. Now, I normally blot my porcelain with toilet paper that's quilted, but not on a structure because the quilt will pattern will be transferred to your structure.
And I'm going to cut this off just so you can see how thick it is. Because it looks really, oh, that looks really thick. No, don't make it really thick. I did when I first started using this stuff, and I try to try to help everyone out by telling you don't make the same mistakes I did. I know the old adage is those that can do and those that can't teach, but uh, I, I can do a pretty good job with this stuff. So you look at the thickness there. That's about the thickness of a business card. And too much thickness can actually detract from your optimal aesthetics. Remember, ideal thickness is less than or equal to about three-tenths of a millimeter. Your average business card is about 0 0.23 to 0.24 in that range. So this is very, very thin. So there it is as applied. And there it is as fired and polished. There it is as applied. And again, as fired and polished. So now let's talk about the new stuff. And that's the high fusing structure. New uses, new structures. So here's our suggested firing chart. Again, you need to get this dialed into your ovens. You need to have cycles that are in there. And what we did is, is in a firing chart, we have it for single units to three unit bridges. In other words, smaller cases. And you see we're climbing at 45 degrees a minute, starting at 450. This is for zirconia. And we're using a high temperature of 760 with a one minute hold. For your medium cases, again, we're starting at 450, but we're climbing slower at 40 degrees, and we're only going up to 755 because we're climbing slower and absorbing more heat in the slow climb. And for your largest cases, we're using a 430 because it's going to take longer for it to dry completely. We're climbing at 35 degrees a minute. We're going up to 750 now because it's climbing so slow it's going to be absorbing more heat. Now, lithium disilicate is about half as conductive as zirconia. So we're starting at 550 instead of 450. We're climbing at 50 degrees, but we're going up to 765 because it doesn't absorb. So, you know, it's, it's time or temperature, you know. So some of the techniques for the high fusing structure, HFS, okay, you can apply the uh, structure first and fire it. And then your Mio colors can be applied or fired afterwards because now the structure is the highest firing material. Or the Mio colors can be applied and fired prior, just like we did in the last with the standard structures. And then the high fusing structure can be applied and fired afterwards. And third, the high fusing structure can be applied and then the Mio colors can be applied. And then they're all fired together on the high fusing structure cycle because you can fire the Mio colors much higher than the 745 that I normally use. Uh, you can fire them all the way up in the mid 800s and they work fine. So let's look at the difference. Let's look at lighting. Okay, so here we have some good light. The window you see on the left is very translucent where it's a little bit frosty on the right. The same thing here in a different light. So you get a little bit frosty, kind of an opalescent look to it. The window is a true clear but it doesn't seem to lower the value. And the enamel just gives you a little bit of diffusion. So again, just like we said in review of what we saw in the first part of this, shear thinning, you're going to pat it. Make sure you get a homogeneous in-sync paste glaze content in it. You can reconstitute with the in-sync paste glaze, but you can also shape it with water. And you can blot it with tissue, but remember, because you have so much of the in-sync paste glaze liquid in it, it's going to be very sluggish or very slow to blot out. Okay, again, cautionary advice. Due to the high translucency, translucency of structure materials, you better get your dirt, your lint out of it and not have any air bubbles in it. So here's a technique one, number one, the high fusing structure added and contoured, and then it's fired. And then we can put the color on top of it. But whoa, look at that dirt. That's what I was telling you. The smallest little piece of dirt shows through. So you can grind out the spot or the air bubble and fill it in with a high fusing structure. Slightly wetter than normal to fill it in. And you have the repair and the meal color added at the same firing. So if you're going to do the repair, use your high fusing structure cycle with about a 10 second hold at the high temp to make sure it melts in. 
And there we have the result. Technique number two, Mio colors applied and fired prior, high fusing structure later. This is like we do with the standard structure. We apply the Mio first, fire it, the color first, fire it, and then we apply the structure. And then this is using the high fusing structure cycle on top of the fire. And this is after rubber wheeling and polishing it. I would tell you to use this technique right here. And then if it goes to doctors and they need to change something, they can always change it. Technique number three is applying the structure and then the color on top of it. After you put a thin layer of the in-sync paste glaze on top of it, and you can fire it and the paste glaze will kind of melt it in and make the two play well together. So it's a very nice tool to have these high fusing materials. All three technique works uh, work, but having the surface texture correct and being able to apply the translucent Mio color facilitates aesthetics along with ease of applying the color changes and the temperature range of the high, high fusing structure makes it easier for you. So you have more structure firing choices and I suggest you get them. I love the way the high fusing structures look. It makes it a heck of a lot easier for us. And I would say, do these rule out having the standard structures? No, because you, once you learn how to use the standard structures, they're great. But it's nice if you have a doctor, especially that that fires stains in in the in the operatory, that it'll make it less prone to rounding out if they don't really have a good grasp of being very, very accurate. So happy holidays to you. If you still have questions, call our technical department at 800-528-5531 for further assistance. Make sure to follow Jensen Dental on Facebook and Instagram so you can be updated every time we go live. But you can also visit jensendental.com forward slash Mio to learn about Mio. And thanks for watching today and please click the follow button to get notifications of future Mio education tips and tricks. And I want to say, you know, we're getting the vaccines out now. Don't, don't put down your guard. Still be careful. Still distance. Still wash your hands. Be kind to each other. And have a great holiday. And please be safe. And I look forward to seeing you again after the Christmas holiday in the new year. Please be safe. Practice with the Mio. You're going to love the material and happiest of holidays to you. I'll see you next year.